Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I know we have some stiff competition from other panels, so we appreciate you uh, coming by, Studio B. Um, so we have a great lineup of four people here. We're going to do this a bit more casually than uh, perhaps some of the other panels. So everyone's going to talk for about five to seven minutes, and then we'll have a conversation. And if you have questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we're going to kick off with Rooney. Uh, Rooney is the director of development at a post-production studio and the writer and creator of Sollywood magazine. Rooney. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Zara, for the introduction, and Nathan and the conference for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself because it kind of goes into more of the presentation. So I'm a student activist at Ohio State University as well as a community organizer in my city of Columbus, primarily working around Black Lives Matter, boycott, divest, sanction, and immigrant refugee rights. So the basis of this presentation is around my personal reality with coming to terms of radicalizing online, yet feeling pushed away from activism um, from the same platform that connected me to the struggle due to seeing images of brutality against black and brown bodies. So, um, do I move it? All right, sorry about that. So um, with uh, the debate of whether or not society should weaponize images of brutality as remembrance or for archiving purposes is as old as photography itself. But since I deal primarily, um, so with this um, um, immense digital output can only make an impact and be seen by others if it is shared enough through expansive social networks and with ever-changing technologies and apps. So rather than solely appearing in print or on television, the overwhelming majority of images and videos are viewed on screens and on devices. This visual impact of traumatic image is not only sensed as and internalized by the viewer, but is instantly shared, passed along, and broadcast online. So the gripping pictures documenting and coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement have undoubtedly changed the course of recent history just as stirring as civil rights era photographs and anti-war photojournalism did five decades earlier. So um, the debate of whether or not society should weaponize images of brutality as remembrance or archivy, what I was saying earlier, is as old as photography itself. But since I deal primarily with film theory and black liberation struggles, I'll highlight two key examples of this debate that basically say, yes, that is important. So with... Um, with uh, Jean-Luc Godard's eight-part video project, Histories of Cinema, which is like four parts, so four hours long. If you have the time and if you're into like being very existential, definitely go watch that. <laughs> but um, he started it in 1988, and it sparked a continental conversation about images of historical trauma. The Holocaust is a nucleus of this series of arguments by uh, European cultural critics, filmmakers, and philosophers about the consumption of archival imagery and of suffering. So Hisarad's works as neither a documentary nor a fiction, instead bleeding two formats into a cine essay where montages are the premium source of visualization and subsequently of critique. Godard's larger project is arguing that cinema should be more like a visual newsletter than sheer entertainment. He uses mashup editing of classical cinema with journalistic photography, sometimes imp superimposing images of the golden age of Hollywood with images of bodies in ovens or survivors of camps being liberated. So some argue that displaying these images in this way or at all risks demeaning them, while others, Godard chiefly among them, hopes that it might expose human horrors as a warning. So that irony can kind of be played in the Q&A section. So um, we are forging a world where evidence of tragedy must be photographed for people to simply acknowledge that there is suffering. What about witnessing death is so alluring to so many? So as I began to um, try and find the answer to that question, I also began to wonder if there's ever been a moment in recent American history where we actively critique the intake of photographic atrocities, spe specifically those against black bodies. <clears throat> So there was a time where W.E. Du Bois published images of lynchings in the NAACP's monthly journal, The Crisis. Whereas many anti-lynching activists in the early 20th century tried to conceal photographs, postcards, or other mem memorabilia of lynching, Du Bois decided to expose the barbarism of white supremacy through the very same visual medium that helped promote it. 
adapting these images that were used to terrorize black people from the, into a tool of protest has become a foundation of the Black Lives Matter movement. Like never before, imagery of abuse, like the cell phone footage of Alton Sterling, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, et cetera, et cetera, their death is now uh, becoming a beckoning call to revolt for the black diaspora. As many of us can recall in the summer of uh, 2016, the bloody run of recording of black death, perhaps the most infamous being Diamond Reynolds' live Facebook recording of the police stop and subsequent shooting of her longtime boyfriend, Philando Castile. Following the path paid by Du Bois, Diamond pressed record because she knew that it would be their only way to maintain a shred of authority over a narrative that would later be twisted against her boyfriend. The camera has become a tool of power, but with that democratization of art and technology, the power is now in the hands of the oppressed. But those who get to see these images can easily rewrite the narrative to fit a political agenda and dehumanize the whole people. So um, with that being said, there are movements, movements around the world that seek to bring justice to these images through new advents like emergency cinema or independent journalism. Chief among them being the anonymous DIY Syrian filmmaking collective Abnadara Films. Composed of several self-taught shooters, mostly in and around Damascus, who want to shift this one-dimensional coverage of the media, by the media, excuse me. Since its emergence during the initial phase of the uprising, Abnudara upload one video online each week, spotlight, spotlighting individual Syrians, both for and against Assad and how they're coping or not coping with a devastating humanitarian crisis. So they have a really incredible quote that I'll finish off with since it rounds up the open-ended nature of this ongoing um, debate. A balance of power must be constructed that allows Syrians to reestablish their own image, separate from the political and media powers that seek to represent them. And to achieve this, there must be a public debate about the inviolability of the body and the right to self-determination in this media age. In the meantime, it is the duty of the world to respect those images, that dignity moving away from the principle of the end justifies the mean, which is promoted by the power, the power hungry and the merchants of the temple. So as I look to this quote to help soothe my anxiety of recon reconciling with violent images online, I also hope to begin to work towards building that attitude with photographic autonomy here in the United States. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rini. Staying, um, yeah, staying on the same theme of kind of live stream and vi visual images, we're gonna turn now to Maya. Um, Maya's a writer and senior editor at The New Inquiry. Thanks for coming through, everyone. Um, can you hear me? OK, cool. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the popularization of real time, uh, which is a filmic convention in which plot progression mimics linear time exactly in American portrayals of the war on terror. And sort of since September 11th, there's been a proliferation um, of such portrayals. Uh, an example that many of you may know is the TV show 24, which premiered in November 2011, sorry, 2001, uh, just two months after September 11th. Uh, it ran for eight seasons and was reprised just last month. Um, and it opens every hour long episode with a single refrain, which is that events occur in real time. And each episode corresponds with a single hour in the day, 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., etc., with each 24-episode season comprising a single day in the life of Jack Bauer, who's an agent employed by the fictional counter-terrorist unit. And each season tracks a terrorist plot already underway, and Jack's attempts to thwart it before the clock quite literally runs out. Time is denoted by a stopwatch, which ticks onward at the beginning and end of every commercial break. Another example is Catherine Bigelow's Zero Dark Thirty, which tells the story of Osama bin Laden's capture. And it has a, clicking a ticking clock too, though it isn't introduced until the final 20 minutes of the hunt when bin Laden is almost dead. In the final moments of the film, a group of US Naval Special Agents fly to bin Laden's hideout in Pakistan. They land, shoot bin Laden twice in the forehead, and then depart the way they came. And the entire filmed assault takes 15 minutes, which correspond, corresponds exactly with bin Laden's real life capture. 
And the example that I'll touch on the most throughout this presentation is United 93, um, which premiered in 2006. And as you may know, or could probably guess, uh, it, depicts, it depicts the events on United Airlines Flight 93, which is one of the four flights that was hijacked on September 11th, 2001. Um, this flight is the one on which passengers launched a counterattack. They improvised weapons, uh, blunt knives for cutting breakfast omelets, and hot water uh, meant for tea. And they forced their way into the cockpit where they gained control of the plane. Um, and they managed to intercept it away from its target, either the White House or the Capitol, no one knows which. Uh, and it nosedived into a field in Pennsylvania, killing everyone on board. Um, in this case, uh, the movie begins in the hijacker's motel room and ends 110 minutes later, which is the exact amount of time it takes to fly from Boston to where the plane crashed in Pennsylvania. And United 93 is particularly interesting to me um, because it sort of tries to refute the popular claim that September 11th was a surprise. In his review of the movie, Brendan O'Neill, I don't know who that is, but he's a film reviewer. <laughs> um, <laughs> He writes that the big difference between this flight and the other three, of course, is that the passengers sensed what was going to happen. They saw what most Americans couldn't, in other words, an impending attack, and then prompted its arrest. And sort of like in death, they've been recovered as heroes. And United 93, if you haven't seen it, is like a, it is a very like heroic movie. And it's a tale of, I don't know, of like American perseverance or whatever, obviously. Um, <laughs> And if we take seriously the assumption that that foresight was unique, that the thing that differentiated this flight from the rest and these passengers from normal civilians, it follows then that anticipation or the sensibility in which possible futures are felt as real in the present and condition action in the present can be manipulated as a tool of national security. Most Americans, so it goes, didn't feel a sense of emergency and that's why they suffered. In the executive summary of the 9-11 Commission report, this is rendered explicit, and officials lament this miscalculation. Quote, we did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been gathering over time. This was a failure of policy, management, capability, and above all, a failure of imagination. Considering what was not predicted, they continue, quote, suggests possible ways to institutionalize imagination, a project whose immediate aim is to instruct Americans, like the passengers on United 93, to foresee their own death. But the 9-11 Commission is charged with providing tools for national security, not masochism, and so it follows that this prescribed reimagining is meant to be recuperative. It makes the possibility of attack feel real, yes, but only to galvanize defense. The anticipatory mode being institutionalized then isn't one that predicts the perfect attack, but one that cements the possibility of perfect intelligence. Returning back to real time, which in many ways relies on and actively manipulates the anticipation of spectators, offers a perfect corrective. When applied to nationalist portrayals of attack, real time enacts a politics of presumption whose effective qualities are twofold. Viewers are encouraged on one hand to suspend disbelief, to indulge, if only momentarily, in the fantasy of an attack thwarted, a nation kept secure. And sort of the clearest example of this is in the TV show 24, where you know that there's an impending threat, but nevertheless, spectators are encouraged to hope that Jack, uh, the counter-terrorist unit agent, manages to like save the American people, and he always does, obviously. Um, but on the other hand, viewers are encouraged to believe fully in the powers of speculation to understand future attacks as necessarily real and looming in order to justify precautionary violence in the present. And this like kind of encouragement um, that's done by real time is very much wrapped up in the literal project that I just referenced of inst institutionalizing the imagination. Um, and it has real material consequences. Civilians are trained to take on the speculative glance of the state and act as agents of public surveillance. The clearest examples of this are if you, see, if you see something, say something campaigns or those white people on planes who, um, who report their fellow passengers because they believe that the, the way they look or the way they talk or what they're eating or whatever indicates a threat. Um, and like most networks of policing and surveillance, uh, sorry, like most networks of policing and imprisonment, surveillance is predictive. The state justifies its reach by codifying the anticipation of a possible catch. When asked why Guantanamo prisoners were being held without trial, for example, Secretary Rumsfeld answered that if they were not restrained, they were sure to kill again. And Judith Butler has a, a quote that I find helpful, um, and it's that the war on terror justifies itself endlessly 
in relation to the spectral infinity of its enemy. A really interesting complement to real time then is something that Rooney was just talking about, um, and live, which is live streaming. Um, and real time sort of like tries uh, so resolutely to mimic the immediacy of live streaming. Um, before police officers shot and killed 23-year-old Corin Gaines, they filed and were granted an emergency request with Facebook and Instagram to remove her feeds uh, and deactivate her accounts. Um, because according to Baltimore County Police Chief James Johnson, the spectators were getting in the way by encouraging her to resist arrest. They were ruining, quote, the integrity of the negotiation process by eliciting a future in which the police failed to exercise power. The anticipatory mode being acted upon, in other words, is the exact opposite of the one that's encouraged by real time, and it was one in which the police and the state failed to uh, manage what they perceived to be a threat. Live videos of black suffering choked the internet last summer. Corin Gaines filmed the events that preceded her murder, Diamond Lavish Reynolds live streamed footage of her boyfriend's unconscious body after police shot him four times. Bystanders filmed the police shooting of Alton Sterling and uploaded it to Facebook and Instagram where it played automatically on feeds for weeks. This is not a simulation. Black and brown people suffer daily. Our, plain, our pain is played live and on loop. Real time simulates the immediacy of this suffering to make white hurt and its compulsory complement, white healing, feel live. Black people are hurting, but because our pain is made into a spectacle, and Rooney obviously just presented on this, we rarely get the healing we need. The state codifies the anticipation of black death. Of white suffering, it demands remedial care. White people like to think that their pain is exceptional, which is why they call it tragedy. September 11th was a tragedy, but it is not, and this bears repeating, synonymous with white suffering. According to the Center for Disease Control, 215 black people and 445 non-black people of color died on 9-11. Undocumented migrants cleaned up these dead bodies, among others. They washed bones and ground them into powder. But because September 11th is rhetoricized as an attack on American sovereignty, and because American sovereignty is mythologized as white exceptionalism, the tragedy of that day is presumed to justify the ensuing panic, or as white America likes to call it, precaution. In short, these real-time depictions encourage civilians to band together to protect a fantasy, white sovereignty, and ensure its utopian ideal, the triumph of a white nationalist agenda. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rooney. Um, going on to, actually going on to kind of more speculation about the future and how these technologies could be used to imagine uh, what might be happening in the future. I actually wanted to jump to Manuel, if that's okay. Cool. Um, great. Uh, Manuel is a poet and artist from the Bronx. I'm going to read a poem first, because um, my presentation is kind of based on this title. It's too high for me right now. I'm going to try to lower it. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. Cool. So this poem is called Race is the Money of the Real. Um, the title is kind of the title of my presentation as well. A LMAO, like a coup in the distance, impending panic attack from a government form's length. The idea of being a citizen is depressing. The humor of Kafka or anything is the horrible fact of it being funny. My stomach turns on a dime. I puke out dead wings and bile. Real artists have hunger breath. <sighs> it's been a slow give black people money month. Need to buy a replacement circular fluorescent light. Look at the gloating spider webs on the bong. My PayPal is garageresidency at gmail.com. Trying to find out whether I dated a literal Nazi. Also one of those mail order DNA tests sounds fun. Let me Google that for you, tragic mulatto. I'm starting a new blog, it's about Wittgenstein's huge dick. I would kill myself, but like I'm too cool, also too lazy. I can see your body tighten like a noose around dark skin. You see my light skin and think we are the same. You ask me to stretch you out, but suicide is expensive. Gender is expensive. Race is the money of the real. When the loud runs out, I feel death's chill. Cool. Uh, so that quote, race is the money of the real, it's a line from this white theorist of digitality and blackness, Alessandra Rango. Uh, she co-facilitates a project called Liquidity of Blackness. Um, 
And this idea erases the money of the real. She's building from Afro-pessimist theory um, and from claims about the boundaries between real and unreal being racialized and being built on anti-blackness um, and misogyny. And so I'm really interested in the fact that it's a white woman facilitating this project um, and that she has kind of the capital and uh, resource access to run uh, that space and that conversation. Um, because I think the points she's making are right, and she's trying to talk about something that interests me, which is this, um, the two sides of the coin of capitalism subsuming sociality um, as far down as it can go, right? So one side of that coin is the financialization of affect, um, affect itself becoming a market aspect. But then the other side of that coin is conversations about reparations, things like wages for housework, reparations for slavery and the Holocaust, uh, and other historical and present day tragedies. Um, because on the one hand, obviously that money is owed, but to kind of put an amount to it and then call it a day is like hush money, right? Um, it's just another aspect of marketizing affect and capitalism, subsuming or extracting value from sociality. Um, so I've been thinking about this app. I'm doing a pitch deck. I'm not going to code. I don't know how to code, but I'm going to do a pitch deck for an app for a, <laughs> um, a fake startup for an art show. And it's called Feels, but the S is a dollar sign. Um, and the app monetizes affect every time that you feel uh, aggressed against. Someone says something like, can I touch your hair or something or whatever. Um, money from their account transfers into yours. How is this facilitated? Obviously, a huge machine of surveillance. And um, your phone is probably recording you all the time so that it can calibrate to your specific affect and the way that you talk and stuff and emote um, and picture recognition and stuff, right? So this benevolent, you know, uh, m all watched over by machines of love and grace, as Richard Brodigan says, right? I'm imagining this surveillance system that paternalistically, like, watches over all your interactions and, you know, when you feel uh, some type of way, it feels it too and it gets the money into your account, right? And so thinking from that position of this fake app, um, I was trying to go a little deeper into that, the two sides of the same coin of uh, marketization of affect, right? Or that tension between hush money and reparations, I guess you could say. Um, because, again, if you put a dollar value on it, on what is owed, you're not really taking uh, the opportunity to the fullest extent. Because what matters, as you know, Sylvia Federici would say, or Leopoldina Fortunati, what matters isn't the dollar amount, but the position. Um, when you're arguing from this position that something is worth a wage, you can kind of dismantle the violence of the wage and what the wage conceals. The wage conceals anti-blackness and enclosure of the womb and stuff. Um, just lost my train of thought. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, but so it's not about the dollar amount. It's about the concept of is, what does it mean to say this is worth a wage? What is the wage concealing? What builds capital value? Or what builds the value of capital, right? Um, so obviously we all want this app. I certainly want this app. Um, I want to get paid when I feel aggressed against, but is that really a solution, right? And so in, when I'm making this pitch deck for this art show uh, at Soil Gallery in Seattle, I'm kind of thinking about um, if this isn't a solution, what does it point to, right? What does it um, say about the financialization of affect and the role that surveillance plays in our interactions? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. That was great. Not too much. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Manuel. So, yeah, our last speaker, and then we'll go into a conversation, so please start thinking of questions, um, is Mayuk. He's a culture writer based here in New York. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Can you guys hear me? I'm like four feet tall. I'm sorry. Um, cool. So I'm going to be talking about a, oh God, it's too low, um, an essay I wrote a few weeks ago um, for Real Life Magazine. Um, and it was mostly about Google Earth and the colonial era biases that are built into mapping platforms like Google Earth, along with how those get represented. Um, so this essay had its genesis in me watching the movie Lion um, a few weeks back. Um, some of you guys may have seen it. Um, it stars Dave Patel and Nicole Kidman. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's based on the true story of this guy named Saru Birli, um, born Sheru Munshi Khan, um, in the 
Indian village of Ganesh Thalai in Madhya Pradesh. Um, and he was born in the early 80s. And when he was five years old, he boarded a train with his brother um, like sometime late at night and basically just got lost. He got separated from his brother and he ended up 900 miles away from home in Kolkata where he couldn't speak the language. You know, it was mostly Bengali and English. Um, he spoke Hindi. Uh, he was lost. He tried to find his way back home, couldn't. So instead he ended up in an orphanage where he was taken in by two Australian adoptive parents who took him to as a Tasmania. Um, and he was born and raised in Aust as Australian and he lost his mother tongue of Hindi, etc. Fast forward to like 25 years later um, and he is living in Australia and all of a sudden he is, I don't know, 25 or something like that. And he has this crazy bout of homesickness, you know, like he sees like Indian sweets being fried and he, I don't know, hears Bollywood music and he's just like, oh, I miss home. Where am I from, etc. And he hasn't been back to his village in so long. And so some of his friends suggest, oh, well, there's this new platform called like Google Earth. You should try it. You know, and this is like the mid aughts. So, you know, this is like, Google Earth is a nascent platform at this point. There's still a lot of fascination surrounding it and not a lot of skepticism surrounding what it can do. Um, so he's like, okay, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, and so he he starts trying to triangulate, you know, where he's from and finding his way back home. And he, the way that he remembers the name of his village, Ganesh Thalai, it's phoneticized in a way that's different from the way it appears on a map. But basically, like, after a few years of kind of, like, trying to do this and trying to find his way home he does and he ends up being reunited with his mom at some point in 2012 i believe um so when all of this made news in 2012 i was really i was you know reading the headlines with a lot of fascination because obviously it took off like wildfire um just like these headlines because it was this weird kind of like Frankenstein of a story that was like <laughs> combining this new technology that a lot of people still didn't really know about, you know, plus like this kind of classic story of homesickness and someone finding his way home again. Um, and so I read those headlines a lot and I was like, okay, cool, this is an interesting story. And then the next year, I um, saw Ruberly came out with his own memoir called A Long Way Home. And in that, he kind of detailed something that a lot of those stories from the year prior did not really detail, which is how much he struggled with the actual platform Google Earth to find his way home. You know, he had to just kind of like chug away at it. He really had to be very persistent, very smart about, you know, what landmarks he remembered and how to kind of, you know, figure out, okay, where is Ganesh the light in relation to my fraying memories, basically. So that was interesting. And so the reason why I was so drawn to Lion when I first heard it came out was like, okay, this whole process like of someone using a technology that is still relatively new to find his way home presents a very exciting and interesting aesthetic challenge to any filmmaker. So like, let's see what they do with it. Huh. So Lion, it's like... It was, like, a fine movie, but, like, you know, the, the, I would say that the part where he tries to find his way home through Google Earth is probably, like, the most, like, inert and unengaging, you know? It's just, like, it's a 30-minute sequence of just, like, it's the same thing on loop, you know? It's, like, Dev Patel just, like, looks at his computer, and he looks like this crazy mad scientist who's just, like, you know, glaring, like, this computer screen is glaring at him, and he's just, like, ah, oh, you know? And then, like, clicking around, and then doesn't find anything, then, like, gets up, and puts the pins on a map that's like mounted on his wall and then I don't know his hair grows out beard grows whatever and then like you know two scenes later like he's on a plane back to you know Ganesh Delay um, and it, it's great but you know I think that this film was very much a missed opportunity in terms of like okay this what separates this story in my head from I don't know something like some weepy that you'd find in the 1940s about someone finding their way home you know it's like this technology and how what a relationship is to it and like how he mediated this relationship um, and so after I saw the movie I started thinking about my own parents and specifically my mother's like relationship to Google Earth and her home so she grew up in a village in West Bengal um, called Balrampur, which is about three hours away from Kolkata. It's what a lot of people would call like a remote village. Um, and I was sitting with her, I think, at the end of last year, and um, I tried to basically like find her village with her like sitting next to me on Google Earth, and I Googled the name like Balrampur, I typed it into Google Earth rather, and um, it gave me like three different ballroom boards, neither or none of which was the one that she grew up in. So we're like, okay, cool. We tried another spelling, whatever. It didn't really work. 
try another spelling, you know, like added one other A somewhere. And then like we found one in West Bengal. We kind of zoomed in and, you know, she and I both have very good memories of like the landmarks, you know, like a specific lake and like other edifices and barns and stuff. And just like when we got there on Google Earth, like all we could really see was just this weird, like muddy, like melange of like gray and brown and green and whatever it's just like completely unintelligible and I can kind of contrasted this with my own experience of you know okay I grew up in Jersey um and so I googled like my hometown of North Brunswick New Jersey um and when I got to like my house you know I could like see everything so clearly I could see like the way my driveway sloped and I could see like the shop right that was like a few you know blocks away like it was crystal clear and I got this kind of very sentimental like paying for home you know and I was like oh I miss New Jersey you know which is like something I never feel but like you know for when I had this experience with Google Earth I was like okay wow um versus my mom didn't have any of that kind of experience when we tried to find Balram on there she was just kind of like confused like is this it is this home I don't know you know um and I think that what um Google Earth where it falters is that there are a lot of places uh, in the world, specifically in the global south, and places that were ravaged by colonialism that are not represented very clearly in the same way that, you know, the New Jersey's of the world are, and a lot of places in, quote unquote, the West are. Um, and what, kind of bringing back to Lion, what I was really, I guess, upset by um, when I watched that is the fact that in terms of kind of what narratives um, get peddled in our kind of popular memory about these platforms, um, I think that the aesthetic of Lion kind of represented Google Earth as this equalizing platform, or rather like an equal opportunity platform for everyone, regardless of where they were from or whatever, to find home in the same way, when really that's just not true. Um, It's very much not true for those of us, like my mother, for example, who grew up after the Indian partition of 1947 and after British rule and all the displacement and uprooting and loss of any kind of cogent sense of home that that resulted in. Um, And I think that in general, what Lion is, is another example of the way in which certain narratives kind of take hold in our popular memory and discourage us from being um, like, I guess, critical or rigorously critical in the way that we should be about a lot of these platforms and what they promise us and who they promise what to, basically. Um, And I don't know, I I think that it was a really big question to me just about like who Google Earth gives like access to, to like feel, I don't know, some sort of sentimental attachment to home. And my mother was not one of those. And I think that reading Brearley's memoir, it was the same thing for him as well, but that just did not make it through into the finished product of what Lion was. And I think that was a huge problem aesthetically. So uh, yeah, that's my spiel. (laughs) Thank you all so much. Um, So we're going to move to a bit of a conversation now. I hope you're all feeling super chatty. Um, I mean, just to kind of kick off, I have a few things written down. Um, Maya and Rini both kind of talked about live streaming and the kind of visual impact of real-time images and live stream and yeah, live stream images. Um, And in something that I work in a lot, we you know, I support kind of human rights defenders to document violations against them as a way of kind of providing visual evidence. Um, and you both talked about that kind of being a powerful way of providing an alternative narrative that would might otherwise be kind of uh, ignored. But at the same time, um, Rini, you talked about this a lot, about how those very images can also be triggering and traumatic. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how those two kind of sides to the coin reconcile a little bit in your work. Um, well, <laughs> now that's a really good question. That's, that's kind of the basis of what I'm trying to reconcile personally, and I'm always trying to figure out that answer and literally never can figure it out. Sorry. No, no, it's no <laughs> problem. You want to actually answer that first? If you understand it? Okay, yeah, because um, for me, because I deal a lot with film theory and trying to figure out more about that, I see film as a weapon. And I kind of talked about this in the presentation, but with that democratization of art and its cultural resources and technology, uh, we actually have the power for the camera to be a weapon for ourselves, where 
for majority of the time, since the beginning, the legacy of of cinema and of imagery has been a tool of white supremacy. And now black people own the image or they own the technology to rewrite that narrative. And what was so interesting about Diamond Reynolds was that she was actually in the car with her boyfriend as it was happening. She was live streaming it. And just seeing him right in the passenger seat was such a phenomenal thing to witness. And it was also extremely traumatic to see, especially with her daughter in the back seat. But yeah, so that was kind of the basis of the essay that I was writing and kind of the presentation of how we could, she definitely took ownership of that moment and we all get to, got to see that, but also seeing how immediately it was twisted against her and against uh, Philando. Oh, he was a criminal, he was a felon, whatever, like stuff of that, that usual um, narrative. But I, I think, I don't know if anyone else in the audience can even answer this, but, um, kind of what is more powerful, her actually doing that pressing record or the fact that uh, the audience can rewrite that against her and against Philando. I think that's something that I've always been really interested in. I don't think we'll ever have an answer to that, but um, the point being is that we could actually do that for ourselves. And I guess that's the real conversation is the fact that she did do that. And that's how we know who she is and we know who he is. So that, that's what kind of what I find fascinating. Um, this is going to come over here. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is maybe straying from your question, but, uh, it seems like when you're talking about your work, um, these videos sort of like live on post facto as sources of accountability and potential tools for like justice or something. Cool. Um, something that's interesting to me about live streaming um, when it is in fact live and not being played on loop afterward, um, is that most often the position of the spectator is like rhetoricized as one of consumption. Um, it's either like a position that yields pain or enjoyment and that's where like the spectacle like comes into play. But something that is interesting to me about like Rooney's work is the ways in which she's um, sort of explaining that uh, this position of the spectator can be one of like authority, um, both in terms of like recuperating narratives. Um, and then also in the case of um, uh, the live streams where like the police are, are, being, are being targeted or like the law enforcement recognizes that like the position of the spectator is also one of authority, not just like post facto in terms of recuperating narratives, but also like when the live stream is being streamed, like this, case that I brought up earlier, uh, the viewers that were tuning in on Facebook and Instagram were actively encouraging her to not to resist arrest, which is what the police said, but they were encouraging her to know like what her rights were. Um, and so it's, I, it becomes very interesting when like those, the spectator position gets controlled by the police because they realize that, and this is like where cop watch comes in too. Um, cop watch is super important if someone like is arrested uh, for like any kind of court case, but also in the very specific moment where the police are being watched and hopefully whoever's doing the cop watching is making sure that people know what their rights are. Um, yeah, I guess I should, yeah. I think that what Rooney was saying about autonomy is a good way to maybe frame a resolution of that tension, right? Because we need evidence. We need to document the trauma of history and the present, right? Violence needs, we need the evidence to uh, recuperate something from the violence, right? But at the same time, um, there is that level of like, yeah, so anyway, the, the idea behind autonomy, I think, is important because even though we need the evidence, we can also refuse to circulate it in the ways that um, people tend to circulate things violently, right? So like, I think of Sudia Hartman in the beginning of Scenes of Subjection where she's talking about that refusal of circulation, right? And, and how to put that against the need for evidence and the need for using that evidence for, you know, whatever documentation or reparations or something. Um, so, echoing Rooney, I guess. Um, no, I think that's a really good way of, of kind of trying to approach this issue, which is also something that I kind of battle with because I mean as you said 
I guess the, the intention when you are kind of documenting things for human rights violation purposes is this dreamed accountability, um, but often, you know, it doesn't happen even though we you know we might document and we might do as much as we can and one of the things that we're battling with right now is kind of understanding how to use digital data in kind of criminal courts in a way that would meet those standards um, when it's all kind of new and changing very quickly. Um, I wanted to return to something that you said really about people c now like black people can own that narrative and you can the fact that Diamond Reynolds could record and press record and put that you know post that to social media is incredibly powerful but at the same time and this is something that Mayuk and Manuel you talk about as well kind of the digital or digital lots of the most popular digital platforms that we use nowadays are kind of the product of colonialism materialism of all these Yeah, it's too powerful. Sorry about that. Go a bit worked up. Um, um, of all these different forms of oppression, um, and kind of knowing knowing the roots of these technologies that we're using, do you think there is space to kind of overturn that same oppression using those technologies? Like, does that kind of affect how you think about using, for example, Facebook or using platforms that have been known to, you know, further oppression in lots of ways or in their infrastructure or in the way that they're built? Hang on. No, no, you're good. <laughs> now, let me just pull out the quote I had at the end because I love that so much and I've been obsessed with Abu Nadara recently. But their quote about uh, bringing a balance of power, um, let me just read it off again. A balance of power must be constructed that allows Syrians, and you could like insert whatever, black people as well, um, to reestablish their own image separate from the political and media powers that seek to represent them. And to achieve this, there must be a public debate about the involuntability of the body and the right to self-determination in the media age. In the meantime, it is the duty of the world to respect those rights, that dignity, and moving away from the principles of the ends, the ends justify the means, which is promoted by the, hung the power hungry. And the quote literally cuts off. <laughs> cuts off on this email. But... Um, yeah, I think, I think that is really, I think the to even start the debate, you have to actually do it to begin with. Like you have to press record, you have to talk about your experiences and what the aftermath of that is. You can you can't predict it, but the power is that you can black people, Syrians, anyone who's going through a humanitarian crisis or their own personal experiences of oppression you now have that technology to own the power of your narrative. And whatever happens in the um, afterwards, it's not up to us, but it's up to the people. But I guess community organizing and building around furthering what the theory of democratization is, which is around ownership and accountability and socialization of people and community building, I think that's, I think that's the most important thing. You can't just live in these kind of like these hubs of oh, we'll just do it for ourselves. That's not how it works. Or at least that's not how I imagine liberation to be. So, yeah. Is anybody else? Um, okay, so to answer your question, Zara, about um, if there's like subversive space, I guess, and within these platforms, I guess I'm very cynical, but um, like, I don't know if you asked me this question like two years ago when like Facebook was always like, oh yeah, like, you know, all these uprisings in the Middle East were like so, uh, we're responsible for these things. I would have been like, yes, of course there's like power within these platforms. Yeah, totally. Um, but I think now in general, you know, kind of, I think that as this conversation is broadening to kind of interrogate like who is employed at these tech companies and who is in power and who's making decisions, I've grown way more cynical about how much space and leeway they create for you know people who don't necessarily have power to i don't know subvert within these spaces if that makes sense you know and i don't know that there's really a solution like you know i don't think that the solution is like necessarily to hire more women of people or or, or people of color etc like within these companies because at the end of the day i think that there's a lot of oppression just baked in the DNA of these companies that is very tough to override, you know, and a lot of the people who will be making decisions will still, I don't know, screw people over if that makes sense. So I guess I, I, I don't know. That's a very like fatalistic question. I'm just like, sorry, like don't use computers, you know, like I don't know what the solution is, but.
Um, I mean, there isn't really an alternative, but we need to use what's available, right? It's not as if we're not going to be on Facebook trying to make stuff happen. So sometimes I think about that question as a way of like attacking the survival of marginalized people, right? Like white people on Facebook are never questioned. Like, why are you on a problematic platform? Because it's Facebook. It's huge. Everyone's on it. So I don't know. I think it's better to just realize that, yeah, it's problematic, but we need to use what's available, right? We don't have time to wait for tools that don't have blood on them. So that's my perspective. No, I mean, I totally hear you on on uh, needing to know, needing to use what's out there, and just just needing to kind of get the job done. Like it's urgent. The, there are these platforms; they need to be kind of used for what they can be. I guess the, my question was more around like. I mean, you mentioned both, I think someone mentioned how Facebook or the police can kind of file a request to Facebook and then take down this video and, and they ultimately, you know, we're, we might be publishing this really powerful message and, you know, I've worked with kind of activist groups and organizers who use Facebook and all these kind of corporate platforms for their organizing and they are penalized when there's, when Facebook or any of these platforms do something to take it down. I mean, I've worked with a, a couple of groups who took, who decided not to have their own website because it was just easier to have a Facebook page. And that's totally legit. Like, it is a lot easier to set up a Facebook page than it is to maintain a website. But ultimately, they stopped getting as much visibility. They stopped getting as much um, as many members at the same rate because they assumed that, you know, their page wasn't showing up as much in the Facebook, in the myriad of algorithms used to control Facebook's newsfeed. So they ended up using some of their very, very limited budget to pay for ads which was wild to me because they have t such a tiny such a tiny budget and they're doing such important work and they ended up paying some of their money to literally the richest company in the entire world and that felt really strange for me um as someone who was kind of trying to help them move in a strategic way and help them help support their work with technology and data so i guess yeah that's more where my where my con my question was coming from and whether it's something that you think about or worry about I have just a small thing to say about that because um, I use Squarespace <laughs> and it's like $16 a month. But that's something like literally, honestly, because Tumblr and Facebook, I mean, these places are surveilled. I mean, everything on the Internet is, but at least owning a, a space in, in cyberspace is an important thing to do. And even crowdfunding for that to not be the case, because I've done very idiotic things early on, <laughs> like organizing on Facebook and uh, on campus, because I was a baby, guys. I didn't know, all right? But, yeah, but that's where everyone is. But, you know, the police can easily surveil that, especially if you're on campus at any one of these colleges. Say the school owns that. And they could see anything that you're doing. But to me, it's just like, well, what else can we do? I think Manuel is just saying that, like, this is what's available. We have to take, um, we have to take what's available and try and rewrite what's going on. And we've been doing that successfully. Black Lives Matter has literally taken photography and videography and made that into a, a promotional piece against the media. Like, this is what's happening. I think a lot of people, even black people especially, but white people um, are like, oh my God, this is happening. Like, cops really harass black people. Yeah, we've been saying this since the beginning of time. But now we actually have the proof to say that. And you have retweets and whatnot. But um yeah i mean you just have to you have to you have to take what's available and try and make it your own i think that would be like the best advice to give out anyone else um yeah i would just say i i, I totally agree and i think that oftentimes these arguments are sort of like willed away by people saying like oh well controlling the framing of something or like taking seizing control over an image like I don't know, it, it's willed away by arguments that are like, you know, that's nice, but it's it doesn't like have any like tangible reality. Um, and obviously I think that that's false and I think it's like rendered very, very clear in the ways that police try to seize control over these images that circulate online, even things like live streams. Um, uh, when they are themselves um, potentially doing uh, an act that could be seen as like criminal. They're very, very quick to take live streams on offline. But I was reading, um, there was uh, a guy last summer who uh, 
was stabbed and his assailant was another black man and he was live streaming it um, on Facebook and the police let it run. They used it to try to find the assailant and they did find him in the live stream, even though like the investigation was ongoing, which was their justification for taking off the, the thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, the investigation was still ongoing and they let it remain online because it was like t tactical and helpful for them. Um, I just want to like, I guess, echo that um, accepting that we need to use problematic tools isn't mutually exclusive with critiquing the tools and, and recognizing their coloniality. Like those can both coexist and they are actually the same conversation. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, yeah, I think there it's, it's interesting to me how um, kind of gets, sometimes gets ignored, but can of often be brought together and not seen as a, it's important that it's not seen as a binary or as a like this either or in these conversations. Yeah, and not as a, uh, just for the microphone, just not as a way to dismiss those things as you were just saying. Um, just to kind of move on a little bit to a, a diff slightly different conversation. Um, I think, I mean, lots of us here are kind of the product of a global 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 movement let's say and lots of these platforms are trying to be this all encompassing universal global thing um, and i guess i mean i wonder sometimes whether the aim of such a universal platform is anything that we sh like whether it's just totally unrealistic and would never happen is kind of silly to even be trying um, i mean for example as as Mike, you were talking about with google earth um, it says it's this thing that captures the whole world and as we know it privileges certain views over others and certain people's access over others on all sorts of levels from like being able to have the data connection required to view Google Earth, let alone the images that you might then see. Um, and I guess I wonder if if there's kind of, if it's more helpful, if it's helpful at all to be aiming for those globalized platforms or whether that's the kind of internationalism that we want to be aiming for or whether the more hyperlocal local views is something is more helpful to what we're what we're achieving uh let's see um yeah i mean i think i totally i hadn't thought of kind of like the hyperlocal as an alternative to this like global idea obviously like the whole idea of kind of you know global unity or whatever is like a little too smarmy for me to like truly believe in as something to aspire towards but at the same time i think that um like what peeved me about google earth i guess and like what i was talking about a lot was this idea that like what prevents what are the conditions that prevent us from really like rigorously critiquing like who they don't serve i guess you know and i don't i don't know i think it remains to be seen like whether their ideal or what they're aspiring towards is like just completely impossible i don't think it is honestly you know and i don't see what's terrible oh god i'm sorry i'm like thinking out loud you know um because i think that Inevitably, at some point, like, um, when you aspire towards some sort of, like, global idea of unity, like, you know, people are going to get erased and stuff like that. And how do you, like, take um, at every step possible, like, you know, make sure that every voice is included and every, like, you know, um, constituent is being spoken to and represented in some sort of way, um, I think is important. I don't know. It's just, like, it's vomited thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know who came up with the like word universal, but I really would love for it to be out of existence <laughs> soon, maybe. I don't think it'll happen. Um, but I mean, what's so confusing to me is like as these claims to like universality or like globalism are made, they line up again and again with like imperial power and desire. The people who make claims to like universalism, it, it's like it's always myopic and like and self-centered and so I, I don't know I like I don't I don't find it particularly helpful to imagine what a sort of like universal to totally democratized like form of technology would like mean or do um, just because it's impossible for me to like remove that 
uh, from Imperial Desires or something. Um, yeah. I guess that's like cynical, but. Yeah, I agree that it no, it'll never happen, but also what is it for? Like when we imagine or when these applications advertise this global connectedness, like it sh always is just this access to resources and exploitation, right? Like that is what universality is. So I'm not sure if if us, you know, imagining or, or idealizing a universal um, can ever not look like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I totally agree. I mean, the it seems like the principles of like globalism and universalism are sort of assumed to be baseline good because they rely on like networks of sharing or something like that. Um, but there are so many people I don't want to share with, or like I don't want I don't want their goods. So I don't understand why that is like taken to be baseline good or appealing or necessary um, for the future. Um, just like something that I always say, I feel like I say this every day, but like the need for nuance is so vital in all of these conversations. We can't just look at, I mean, like with technology and with the internet, especially we kind of see the world as like a global community, which is cute, but it's not the reality. <laughs> you know, your next door neighbor has a completely different life and viewpoint as you do. And you have to take that into consideration with, especially with activism online and in IRL as well. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think in after reading Moke's article on, or the essay on uh, Lion and Google Earth, it made me think a lot about kind of alternatives to Google Earth. Um, and the best one that I could think of is kind of community mapping projects of people who otherwise wouldn't get their, you know, their areas being on line or being mapped, being able to map them not in a way that makes sense to Google or that makes sense to some other platform, but in a way that makes sense to what they need and mapping out things that are important to them. And that's kind of what triggered my kind of, is, is that kind of more hyper-local use of technology more helpful? I think in, in my mind it is because it's so much more tangible and it's easier to understand what the needs are as opposed to just like framing, you know, as you said, like that universal does line up so clearly, obviously, with the people who are designing it and imperialistic desires that it's it's just, yeah. How does it make money? Well, community mapping projects. Yeah, that, that. Oh, I mean, so it's not a it's not a specific app. It's often just like. An idea. No, no. I mean, it happens. I mean, it sometimes it's just like um, groups who live in rural areas who need to just get together and literally just map out their what they are seeing and their realities and it gets put online via for example OpenStreetMap um, which is a yeah it, again doesn't make money it's just a, a thing that's very useful and used by lots of people online. Did you have something? Um, something that I'm sort of like wary of uh, I feel like in a lot of these conversations there's a baseline assumption that um, hyper local community making is like diametrically opposed to um, uh, the desires of those who are like have power over like global or like universal projects or whatever. Um, but something that's so scary to me is that like law enforcement um, and people who control things like um, Facebook and Google Earth are obviously extremely aware that um, the language of like hyperlocality and community is really, really appealing for a lot of people. And so it's often co-opted. Um, and this is like different from, I mean, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but um, uh, the like police and FBI, for example, um, when a lot of people or not a lot of people actually <laughs> um, uh, left um, uh, Minnesota to go and join like Al Shabaab and ISIS or whatever. The police and FBI were going into these communities and saying like, we are going to help you like do this community making, and like we and they established projects with like kids in the community. And so like they use the logic of like hyperlocality um, and like community investment and totally co-opted for projects that are obviously like in direct opposition to the sorts of things that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So I feel like even, I mean, what's, yeah, even, yeah, just like claims to 
to hyper locality or something are are still yeah co-opted yeah i don't know yeah cool um we have about 15 minutes left um are there any audience questions while we're here oh yeah um so i work with the internet society and one of the things that we do actually preach to some extent is universal acceptance when it comes to internet standards so that if you're in one place you can talk to someone in another place and just last week I did the internet governance forum in Kabul um, and you know and the great stuff happening in Afghanistan only 10% of the people are on the net um, uh, and the women that are organizing because it gives them they're very much empowered because they can do stuff because they're online but there was issues with you know, with people speaking languages and obscure languages, they're getting top-level domains that are international, internationalized domain names and things like this, is having a standard where so that anybody anywhere can hit a button in their browser and access those sites. So there are certain, I'm just making the point that there are certain things, technically speaking, where universal acceptance is a good thing. I do think that's different from... Oh. Yeah, but you were saying it was from a technical point of view, whereas really you're talking from a social point of view. Right, exactly. I think like math, like 2 plus 2 is always going to be 4. That's universal. But that's not the same as like we're all the same. You know, we all... The robustness principle, very famous thing upon which the whole of, you know, the internet is based. Postel's robustness, RFC. Was it Postel? It yeah, John Postel's thing, which is, you know, be liberal in what you take in, but conservative in what you put out. You know, which is a networking principle, but it's how that's why the internet works. It's because of that principle. Does that still happen? I feel like we're all putting out a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, I want to know. I really. <laughs> I guess I'm not gonna get an answer. <laughs> all right, anyone else? Were there any other questions? No. Cool. Hi. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no talking among yourselves yet. Um, I guess, I mean, I have a question. Uh, it's kind of a speculative one. So I'm reading this book at the moment um, that talks about kind of humankind and the history of humankind. Uh, it's called Sapiens. I don't know if you're nodding or... Oh, so what do you think? The hi no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, don't worry. <laughs> so humans. <laughs> what do you reckon? Where are we going with this? No, no, I have a specific question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. And there's this line that says, um, to change an existing imagined order, we must first believe in an alternative imagined order. And it's within the context of kind of culture and all these things that we believe in, like money, money being a thing. It's an imagined order. Um, different societies, societal norms, they're just things that someone that people came up with millions of people believe in and because we all believe in them we act in that way um i guess this thing of kind of alternative imagined orders is something that i've been thinking a lot about recently and diving a lot into kind of dystopian science fiction to provide a a route for something better in the future maybe um and i wondered if you know what are the alternative realities or the the thing, the alternative imagined realities that you're all aiming for or thinking about with your work? Like, is there something that you have in mind or is there, is there something that you're just deeply trying not to get to? Uh, I have three words. Full communism now. Yes. I'm kidding, guys. But <laughs> <laughs> almost, not yet, but, you know, we can work towards it. Yeah, that's a super interesting question. I would say that it's, it, what's interesting to me is how believing in these concepts and needing to just do them is kind of the same thing. Like, you might not believe in money, but what are you going to do, not use it? Right? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. But I, bl I don't believe in money. It's not real. It's paper, but I still use it. But I, at the same time, that's still a kind of belief, right? It's like um, not belief, but superstition. Like, I keep the cross on my door threshold just in case, right? Um, but so, in, in that context, I was thinking about uh, this meme by my friend Gangster Popeye. She's a Salvadorian trans woman. Um, and it's the meme is just, uh, uh, what is it, like, caution, not caution, attention, the U.S. is now transitioning to a sick sword-based economy. So, that's my alternative. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um. I feel like this question is would be much easier to answer if I like believed in narratives of progress. Um, I feel like that's when like <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean I, that's when it's like most e easy to imagine like the utopia or whatever. Um, and I think the organizing principles, like working toward alternative realities, that I find like most useful and among my like friends and peers um, that are most activating are those that are like positioned against a reality that's like really like fucked and permeable right now. So like beyond like abolish the police, like abolish prisons, like it it is difficult for me to answer this question. Yeah. Narrative that you don't want to get to. Right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say I was gonna say stuff similar to Maya, but I, I mean I'm still wrestling with this question or wrangling with it, whatever about um what alternative worlds I'm imagining in my work, you know. But seriously, because like um I don't know, like I I'm still attached to this. Uh, no, oh my god, I I'm being serious. Like I <laughs> I I'm really drawn to that question, especially when I don't know I. As I was talking about my Google Earth um, essay, I was also thinking about this other essay that I wrote for real life on on Grindr, um, and specifically the incidents of Grindr spam bots, um, and how it was just like, it was really interesting to me, because it's so like a short summary of this essay, sorry, um, is basically like Grindr spam bots, they're just like these... Um, anonymous like awful bits of software that like you know have like really blurry torsos for like their profile pictures and everything and they just like message like anyone on the platform like gross of your race or your weight or whatever like you know hey what's up or something extremely nondescript and boring um it's just like the same message over and over again and um when like I realized that spam bots were a thing on the platform. I was actually really, I was intrigued by this because I think that Grindr is a platform that is, it allows like so much racism and so many isms to just like flourish. You know, people be like, no fats, no femmes, no Asians, no this, blah, blah, blah. And like the spam bot, you know, this like accidental piece of software is kind of realizing this like almost utopia or utopia is like a very dangerous word whatever but like you know it, it's it's realizing something that this software and this tech company hasn't been able to figure out um and i don't know i i guess that's the, that's the first thing that i gravitated towards when i was like thinking of your question it's just like you know and in my day-to-day -day life like what do i want i want to be spoken to as if i'm a white man if that makes sense with the kind of like the respect that's afforded to a lot of white men you know because like when i got those messages from spam bots you know it's like wow i'm not like treated with that kind of just like respect i guess almost you know of just kind of being like be being seen as like an obviously viable sexual partner in the same way like i just because of my skin color i'm not seen in that way you know so i don't know that's, that's my roundabout way to answer your question i guess it's like you know my utopia is like when everyone wants to have sex with me that's it <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a great mic drop to the end of the session, but we have like three minutes left. <laughs> wow. Only I timed this better. Um, do we have any follow-up questions? I mean, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm glad this is captured on video forever. Um, are there any other follow-up questions? <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of realizing that we didn't actually talk, we didn't talk so much about the description of this panel, for which I apologize deeply. Um, I mean, one of the, <laughs> I mean, we didn't include that in the description. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that was mentioned in the, in the description that we didn't talk about so much was kind of how dissemination and sharing of content is almost as important or as important as the content of that content. It's the content of that thing itself. Um, and I wondered if any of you had some kind of some thoughts on that, whether that's, I mean, that was a statement that that we were given with the panel description. Um, so I, I wondered if uh, any of you had thoughts on that. And I think a couple of you talked earlier about like how stuff, how stuff gets shared and disseminated being a powerful way to get narratives out to people who otherwise wouldn't. And Yeah. <laughs>
Um, well, I disagree. I think we talked about it a lot. But um, maybe just echoing Rooney, autonomy is, we do have it now. It does exist. We have access to these tools. Of course, they're covered in blood, but we need to use them. Um, dissemination is our, that's how we construct reality, right? Um, circulation is, is, is authenticity or something. And I think autonomy is a way, is, it needs to question that. It needs to push back against um, dissemination and circulation being the real, right? So that's my thought on it. I'm curious to like bounce off that question and also Manny's answer is that like uh, of course there, there's a major purpose of activism is to like reach the audiences that aren't attuned with the realities that we're trying to make more aware of in society but I mean it's also this thing where like we were saying before, you know, the end result ends up being white people just being surprised and due to their like persistent Naivety. ignorance that, that these kinds of injustices are happening. So I mean to bounce off that question, like, is the dissemination of these things to audiences who wouldn't normally be exposed to them even important? Or is it more important that within these communities infrastructures are being built using the tools of, of these digital realities? to create systems that are allowed to live even temporarily more autonomously away from injustices. And I'm curious about thoughts on that. Um, yeah, that's a great, really important question. Um, and I, I think I agree with you that um, I am not at all interested in white people watching photos of like fucked up shit happening to people of color so that they can like be more aware of what the world is like um I have no interest in like teaching those people um I don't know if other people how other people feel but I'm just like fuck them <laughs> um but I do think that these that these videos and things can circulate and and this is what I was like trying to get to I think like in the presentation um which is that like oftentimes these videos are not just like it's not just that they were made and that they're like circulating post facto as like objects of the past. Um, oftentimes they do influence um, court proceedings and like people's livelihoods. Um, and there is a real interaction that happens between spectators and like, agents of the state um, and people are who are determining the fates of, um, of vulnerable individuals and communities. Um, and I think figuring out how to harness that um, is sort of what I am most confused by and interested in, and there probably you guys can speak to this more. Um, but there's something very, very cool to me about like being able to watch a live stream video and helping encourage the person to like resist arrest and stay safe and stay vigilant. Um, that's a really, really interesting position that we're only seeing sort of like coming, coming online now. It's a technology that's been like available for a long time people have been doing that in person um but the fact that it's available on a wider scale and that communities can form around resistance and around like a kind of live resistance is really really exciting and i can see that being a way more important tool than like teaching people who i don't know who don't know better Um, yeah, and I think the, we didn't really talk about, well, I mean, I guess the, the solidarity piece on that is also incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and maybe that's a really good place to end <laughs> instead of the earlier conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for so much uh, for, for your wise words. And um, thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>